be really, really good. And, and I hope we can get to, to a lot of them, and I hope we can commit to all the stages a little bit later because they're really good. Um, and also fascinating is many of the questions they have, Dr. Moore, you've already answered <laughs> a lot of them, but we'll give you some time to, um, they have the, they're asking the right questions. So we'll start with this. Uh, Pinellas is number three, but Pensacola is number two. You heard you say that. Um, I've heard that denial expressed on that video repeatedly in Pensacola. Those who are not impacted just do not know what is being done to spread the word and increase teacher awareness of their own personal racial bias that are impacting African American children at a greater percentage than other races. I can answer that. We've actually been we've been trying to negotiate a settlement with the district that would require. Uh, more trainings that would address that issue. We, we all have pulled bias, right? Um, and this public school system doesn't exist in a vac vacuum. So we're trying to negotiate that, but the district is not moving on that. So uh, they claim to have some already in, but if we look at the racial disparities, we can see the outcome. It's still the same black children are still being disproportionately everything arrested suspended um, so there definitely needs to be more I encourage you all to check out tolerance.org that's our initiative with SPLC where we provide free training and materials to thousands of schools um, and we provide it to Escambia County I think it's interesting uh, Escambia County we have the same prosecutor for some of the other counties Santa Rosa Okaloosa and Walton so it's the same State Attorney's Office, same prosecutor, and Scambia is so much worse. Right. I think that's kind of an interesting comment. Must, the must be the schools. Yeah. Must be the school. And we have talked about that a lot in some of the previous forums. And can you remind me, where can they find those? Because we specifically address the question of why so many of those cases end up at the prosecutor's office. All those stories were published at CJ Street Street Report. One, one more time. CJ Street Report. CJ's Street Report dot com. No, dot blogspot dot com. We're gonna go write it on the board. <laughs> All happy. I'm, I'm gonna have Kante do that. <laughs> Uh, we talked about the, the lawsuit already. This, this next question, has the Justice Department on the federal level been contacted relative to looking into the racial disparity here in Escambia County concerning African American students being arrested, sent to alternative schools, sent to the Dean's office? Yes, we have. Can you tell us where we are sure. with that? Well, the federal government works slow, so they're still investigating. Uh, we've had we attempted, like I said, to negotiate a resolution with the school district, and we were making progress at one point, and then we sort of hit a brick wall. Um, and now the next thing is going to be the report we publish on uh, Camelot. And the, what we found is the school to prison pipeline for profit happening here. But the federal government uh, is still continuing their investigation. I uh, just talked to them a few weeks ago, and it's still ongoing question here about hope. Do you believe or think that there's a chance for a change in the school system here, or will we have to tear it down and rebuild it to improve the lives of our youth? Tear it down. <laughs> How can we as citizens improve or help change the outcome of inequality in schools and in our own communities? Uh, I think we have to go back and look at the legislative laws that are putting the divide in between the different schools with those busing rules. Uh, it's not right. Uh, ELEC is a legislative body. They, they have closed door, off the record meetings that determine how much money is gonna be allocated to a school and they separate the districts and things of that nature. So some children don't get the same opportunities to go into um, maybe different school systems. Sometimes, I, I know in, 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 in our case, um, there, there are people that are closer to schools, but the buses still bring them to a, a school that's further away, and it's intentional. And I think we have to start asking the questions, why? Uh, when I was in college, and I'll say this, the college that I went to, and I won't name it, but it, we had a, a, a blended campus and we had an all-black campus. That was a little bit further out. The all-black campus allowed buses to come to Jackson, Mississippi, and they would drive and bus people to the all-black campus. 
Keep in mind, you had to pass up the Blended campus to get there. And also check out noplaceforachild.com. We have some things that will support the shirt. Um, and we have brochures back there, right? The No Place for a Child brochures. And both of those web addresses, addresses are up on the chalkboard. How do we not arrest the student, but keep them from disrupting the class? When as an educator, we have reached out to parents with no help. This particular uh, question comes from someone who is a home visitor, educator on weekends, whatever it takes. She's not getting the help she wants from parents. It's keeping uh, other children from learning. What is your advice? Well, you know, we have to take every child as it comes. It's, it's not like uh, Walmart where we can return the ones we want or, or send them to another <laughs> store, right? So if a child is displaying behavioral problems, uh, the correct response is intervention, support, uh, we found that, you know, educating a child and providing them with support is a lot cheaper than the $60,000 a year it takes to uh, detain them and incarcerate them. So there are plenty of evidence-based solutions that allow us to address student behavior. I'm an educator of 12 years. I have a nonprofit with two school, two programs in Florida, two juvenile justice programs, uh, and we teach music, and which is really hard, right, because you have to make noise, and we were kids who've all been arrested. And I, we still find ways to channel that injury and, and that noise, right, into positive ways. So I think uh, it just requires creativity, resources, and it takes time. Um, also, I just want to add, you know, if, if you have a problem with your child, you know, go old school. My mom, if, if I act old school, <laughs> going down. I'm just, I'm just being honest. You know what I'm saying? But you don't have to go there acting up. You know what I'm saying? You go there and you, you get involved with your child and you, you go ahead and, and, and go and, and, and get involved with the teacher because sometimes the, the, the teacher might be messing with your child. Right. So, so you might have to get to the bottom of what's going on at that school. And really quick I want to say because the question also said you know if the parents not engaged and the parents not able to support. Uh, when I was in high school both of my parents were incarcerated. I was displaying behavioral problems. I was kicked out of school, thrown away, placed into this alternative school with less books, uh, teachers, lower quality teachers, but I still went on to graduate college five times and become who I was today. But the school still threw me away because they were tired and they used the same excuse, well, as parents are incarcerated, what can we do with them? So it takes a village, right? And the school is an integral part of the village that we when we cannot throw children away, and that's why we're fighting for this area. I just wanted to jump in and because some people may walk away and say, everybody on this panel is from someplace else. But as a, a parent advocate, a youth advocate in this community, and I've got parents who are looking at me right now who will stand up if, if, you know, if I ask them to and tell you, when you have a system who doesn't engage parents, that's right. And when the only time you call them is because your kid is in trouble, I don't have children. However, I can tell you that I've spent a lot of time with even JP here. So I've got like nieces and nephews <laughs> like here, right? right. Um, but this is a school district that when, when, I, when I, be, I asked the question, when did you first interact with the parent? Was it the time you called him sleeping class? Or was it the time that now he's asleep and he wakes up angry and you're kicking him out of class. Like when did you first engage that parent? Right. Or was it the time when he was late that first time or did you wait till now he's a part of a gang and now you want to call the mom and say, we've got to disrupt the child. And so we've really got to be careful in this school district to blame parents. Because yes, our teachers are taxed, but Paula uh, will tell you, we don't even have many social workers in our school system. And our counselors, their only job, let's be clear, is to prepare that child to apply to college and standardize and take standardized tests. Our counselors are not social workers, and we have very few social workers, I think like three to five, for the whole school district. Four. We have four social workers for the whole school district. So we are in a system that does not engage parents but expects them to bend over backwards the second little Johnny has a problem. Right.